Uh, our guest speaker tonight requires no introduction, so I won't bother even giving you one. Just a massive round of applause, and I really mean a serious, like, lift the roof round of applause. I mean, Colin got a big one. Got to be bigger for David Nutt. So, a big, massive round of applause for David Nutt. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's... Uh... It is great to be here. I hadn't realised what a beautiful city this is. I've never been here before, so it's very appealing. And, and also, it's great to be at a in the pub meeting again. I've done a few of these, but the one that um, I did first was actually down in Westminster, and it was just a few days after I was sacked. And uh, and it was the first chance I had to sort of argue my side of the story and uh, and see whether the public were interested in, in my perspective, and that course, turned out to be uh, quite clearly the case that they were. So you've had quite an influence in terms of my, um, my fight back against uh, the government. So thank you all. So what I'm going to do tonight is just uh, introduce you to some of the challenges that relate to drug policy and, and in relation to drugs and um, a range of different drugs. But just as a bit of background. Uh, so yeah, maybe I should look and see up here. Who am I? Yeah, sorry, I'm a psychiatrist. You know, uh, as I say, with a name like Nuts, there were only two professions in medicine to go into, and, and the brain's infinitely more interested than the other one. When, when, you get to, when you get to my age, there's no doubt about it. Uh, maybe you youngsters uh, but, uh, think differently. And I've worked in um, mostly, I went into medicine to do research. I was in, always interested in drugs and drug addiction did medicine to do research, and been, been quite successful in that, in, in the sense that I've managed to do a lot of research and publish a few papers, and mostly I've worked in the UK. Um, I've had four kids, uh, and I've seen them go through teenage years, in fact, uh, it almost all just about got out of that now, uh, which is not bad, I suppose, four out of four, you know. Could have been a lot less, some of their friends almost didn't make it, but I've seen a lot of things in relation to alcohol and drugs that I, um, I had probably hoped I didn't, wasn't going to see, but it gave me a lot of insights. And then, of course, the reality of, uh, was that I'm an ex-government drugs advisor. And the truth is, almost none of you would have ever heard of me. I've had, had any of you heard of me before I was sacked. Yes. Just a couple of biologists, a couple of psychopharmacologists. No. So that was the first lesson, actually, you, you know, to the government. If you want people to get famous, sack them. It gives them a huge amount more credibility in the media. And uh, as a bit of background, I had worked for the government uh, in an unpaid capacity for 10 years, mostly trying to understand drugs and drug harms and try to rationalize the approach to drugs. And uh, I think it was fair to say I probably knew more about this whole topic than anyone probably else in the UK, to be honest, certainly more than any politician. But what does that matter? No. So, well, this is the uh, caricature of my being sacked, and it's uh, it's false in one way. Is that as a psychiatrist, I don't wear a white coat, except when I'm on TV. Um, the real importance of the caricature is the scales of justice on the left here, because you see, on the one side you've got beer and facts, and on the other side you've got strange green chemicals in plastic bags. I don't know what they are, and actually no one does, unfortunately. It's part of the problem. But the, the debate at present is around which of those is more harmful. But this is a brilliant front page. I'm sorry, I should have said the book of cannabis, by the way, is falling from my grasp there. Um, but look at the top left hand. And there's Andre Agassi. Now, Andre, this is a really a remarkable juxtaposition. So here are two people, both equally good at tennis. Uh, well, I was once, anyway. Um, uh, who are interested in drugs. And Andre, of course, the, the, Andre just published his autobiography that week. And in his autobiography, he had um, come clean, that's a joke, sorry, um, about having taken drugs when he was younger. And um, he'd taken, when he was Wimbledon champion, he tested positive for methamphetamine, which the Americans like to call crystal meth. And that presented the authorities with a huge problem. You just imagine what's going to happen tomorrow when Federer tests positive. 
you know, I mean, that's going to put a lot of pressure on the tennis authorities. Is the rules say, and, and the rules are kind of somewhat arbitrary, but they do say you must be banned for two years. And um, so maybe Andy should have spiked his drink. But anyway, but, um, you must be banned for two years. You could have a life ban. And there's no logic to that other than it's a way of trying to deter people from using drugs, which are in many ways often called illegal. But uh, they didn't know what to do. So what they did was what I thought was a very English thing. They decided to ask him to tell the truth. Andre, did you take any money? He said, of course not. You know, your test must be rubbish. I would never touch the stuff. I went around and said, great, okay, we'll go away and play some more tennis and be a good boy in future. Which he did, and he won another major or two. And then when he retired, uh, he fell on slightly harder times. And then he decided to write his autobiography. And, and, and it may be guilt, I don't know what it may just be, a few million more dollars. He decided to tell the truth. And he said, yes, he had taken Christy Murphy. So there's a lot of lessons in that. One is, of course, if you're very, very important, it doesn't matter what you do, you'll get away with it because you're too important to, to actually be uh, dealt with in, 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 as normal people are. But also it shows the huge ambivalence we have as a culture. We're quite happy to buy loads more copies of his book because he admitted to taking drugs. But we disapprove of drug use in other people. So there's, a, there's an ambivalence there, which I thought was you know, rather remarkable and, and, and uh, topical when it came out. So why was I sacked? Well, it's not entirely clear. Um, I, I discovered on Question Time last, last Thursday that Alan Johnson thought I was, it was in favor of legalizing drugs, which I certainly never said and never, never believed. But that's his justification. Uh, I'm not entirely sure they know why I was sacked, actually, because um, it was a rather botched and uh, rather impulsive kind of decision. But what they said was I was getting mixed up in policy. And I was the senior scientific advisor on that committee. My, my job was to say whether the, the science that under, that on which the drug laws were based was actually correct or not. So I essentially said that uh, current drug policy is not evidence-based, and therefore it could be unjust. Um, but that wasn't seen as very uh, attractive. They also said I was giving mixed messages. And uh, what I said was this. I said was, we had just banned GHB, and we were in the process of trying to control GBL. But I said, look, if you're going to do that, you also ought to know that were alcohol to be discovered today, you'd have to ban that too, because the pharmacology of alcohol and the pharmacology of GHB are actually pretty similar. So just think about that when you're rushing to ban drugs. You know, just, just remember that alcohol is actually pretty toxic. And um, I, also, I also said, and this is the thing that they really didn't like, was that alcohol is more toxic than cannabis. And I will show you the evidence of that shortly. Uh, and they also said they lost confidence in me, which is political speak for the fact that I wouldn't toe the line anymore. And they, you know, that's, uh, that was the reason for getting rid of me. So I want to start with some principles, some first principles. What is a drug? And who should actually say what a drug is? Well, this is my favorite definition of a drug. And, um, and here are a couple of politicians who've commented on drugs. So Jackie Smith, who was a Home Secretary, had a big run-in, I'll tell you about later on. She said, I smoked cannabis, but I didn't enjoy it. And I think, actually, when you were in Oxford in those days, you know, you couldn't get into the Labour Party unless she did smoke cannabis. So she forced herself to. And David Cameron said, I did things when young that I shouldn't have. We all did. And by we, he means the, or the Tory front bench. Um, he won't tell us what he did, but I know, and I'm going to show you later on. So. <laughs> now, some politicians are honest. Tim Yeo is a man famously of five mistresses. I, I think they're serial, not in parallel. But um, as he said, as a student, he smoked cannabis, and he, did, he liked it. And he's honest, because most people do. And then, of course, there's Boris. And Boris has a very you know, clever way of using humor to deflect criticism. This is an outrageous slur. Of course I have taken drugs. Sometimes we think he probably still does, but I don't know about it. 
Now, this is the most, most significant um, slide you will see, because this is, this is, it's both funny, but totally to the point. This is a clever, clever piece of advertising, and it hits right at the, the current way in which the alcohol industry is controlling what most people think about drugs, which is that alcohol is not a drug. And I don't know, did any of you see that, that Panorama program, or Horizon program, a few years ago? Britain's top 20 drugs. Well, you may have seen it. And we went out in the streets and we asked people, you know, is alcohol a drug? And they looked at you and said, of course not. You say, well, if you drink, you know, you feel different. It changes your brain and you might feel wobbly. But you might then have a terrible hangover. I mean, it, surely that's all evidence that it's a drug. And they look at you and they say, but are you stupid? If it was a drug, it would not be legal, would it? And this circular argument between legality and drugs is one that gets to the, really right to the root of this problem and right at the top of, of, of policy making. And the drinks industry is very keen that you don't believe that alcohol is a drug. But it is. This is a drug. I'm taking it now. Uh, not taking a lot of it. Um, no. Actually, it is pretty disgusting, but anyway. I was warned against it. <laughs> what would I say? Well, a drug, of course, is a substance which, when taken into the body, produces physiological changes. And in the context of the discussion we're going to have tonight is about producing changes in the brain, which are usually pleasurable, but, of course, sometimes damaging. And this tension between pleasure and harm is the crux of the question. Now, how many of you have seen this image? But you're old. Ah, oh, that's better. Better. You're remembering now. Your memory's coming back. Yes. Again, can you put them up again? Who's seen her? Who's seen this? And who hasn't seen it then? Let's go the other way. So quite a lot of you young people haven't seen this. So this is Leah Betts. This is the most famous image of someone in intensive care probably there's ever been. And, um, and Leah Betts died in 1995. She was on her 18th birthday. She was Having her 18th birthday party, she took a couple of ecstasy tablets, we think about 80 milligrams. And she was under the impression, wrongly as it turns out, that if you get to feel strained on MDMA, then you should drink lots of water. Because at that time, the health message was people were dying of dehydration in clubs because they danced for hours and hours in the hot club. And the message was drink water and chill out. So Leah drank lots of water, seven liters of pain. And she died of water poisoning. And that advert went up over the billboards in this country with the title Sorted, because Sorted was the term you used when you went into a pub. You got your pills, and they said Sorted, you were Sorted. And what's interesting about that image was that image was funded by a number of very, very big and powerful uh, com um, advertising companies. And they did it for free. But they did it confident in the knowledge that they would get enormous uh, contracts from the drinks industry. Because the drinks industry at that time was very, very concerned that people were going to switch. They were going to switch from alcohol to E and other drugs. And that would do a lot of damage to the industry. So they tried to scare people off it. Now here's an image that you, none of you have seen. I bet none of you have seen this. So here's a student a couple of years ago, university student in the golf team at Exeter University, and he dies after a drinking game, after a golf match. And drinking games kill a few people every year because they encourage people to drink when they're incapable of playing the game. And uh, you didn't see that, because it wasn't interesting to the media. Because, partly because it's quite common, and partly because, of course, no one was paying for it to get into the, into the media. So the reason we've heard of Leah, but we haven't heard of Gavin, and more than many people like Gavin, is essentially because Red Bull don't care about people dying of alcohol. In fact, what they do is they sell large amounts of stimulants to allow people, which is called caffeine, of course, to allow people like you, some of you will probably have taken it tonight, to stay awake so they can drink more. So they're actually encouraging the use of alcohol by providing a stimulant that keeps you awake. And wherever stimulants are, stimulant use goes up, alcohol use goes up. In fact, the only person you probably know who died of alcohol poisoning is this one, which is Amy. 
And it, is, it would have been a real opportunity, wouldn't it, when she died, for someone to really have a campaign to tell people that you can die, as she did, by drinking about one and a half bottles of vodka. That's what she was like. And it's not uncommon. We had a student die in our college university and last year of alcohol poisoning. In fact, it's so common, it doesn't really get in the news anymore. About three young people a week die of alcohol poisoning. They just drink so much that it kills them. Because the, the safety margin for alcohol is quite low. And they often die on their birthdays when their friends give them a good time. But a good time kick is too good and it kills them. The other thing we did when I was on the ACMD was we, we took this question of date rape. There was a lot, of, a lot of concern that date rape was due to drugs like rohypnol and GHB. And we did a number of well, pieces of research on this. And we came to the conclusion that actually half of all date rape is just alcohol. And half is alcohol plus other drugs. So alcohol is far and away the most dangerous drug for women. And, and obviously in some circumstances men as well. I want to show you a bit of recent data that you probably haven't seen. And the key, element, the key message is in the red box. In the UK today, alcohol is the most common reason for death in men under 50. That means you will. Most of you will. A quarter of all male deaths between 16 and 24 are due to alcohol. So it, it's, it's a, such a staggering figure. It's amazing that none of you know it. For women, it's less. For women, it's only about 15%. For young, younger girls, women are up to the age of about 36. It's about 15% of deaths are due to alcohol. And then it tells up. But notice how it's, it's flattered in with men. The women, young women, persist in killing themselves with alcohol until they're in their 40s. We've seen a, 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 a sea change in the way that alcohol is damaging the health service. So back in 95, 96, there were 94,000 admissions were alcohol related disorder. They went up to 208,000 within a decade. And the last figures we have are one over a million hospital episodes, of which 13,000 were people under the age of 18, so of before the drinking age. You compare that with ecstasy and related drugs, about 2,000 and cannabis, about 700. So we have orders of magnitude difference in terms of the harms from our problem. And if we look back over 40 years, we can show the alterations in the likelihood of dying from a range of disorders. And all the other lines, all mixed up together, they cover everything from road traffic accidents to heart disease to lung disease to diabetes. And they're all going down. Some of them are going down by quite a lot, by two-thirds. And that means we're getting much better at preventing and treating every illness we're confronted with. And the one exception is liver disease. And here you see liver disease is the red bar, and that's going up and up. And 80% of that rise in liver deaths is due to alcohol, and 20% is due to hepatitis, either viral hepatitis or some other. So that's, that's the consequence of our changing the way we think about alcohol about 30 years ago. And what's remarkable is it's very special to this country. So here's the European data. And you see there is no rise in liver disease in Europe. In fact, liver disease falls pretty much the same as all other diseases. And that's because most European countries that used to have a lot of liver disease have actually done something about it, and they've changed the way people drink, and they've reduced access to cheap alcohol. But we haven't done that. In fact, what we have done quite systematically over the last 20 years or so is make alcohol more affordable. So you, the blue bar is the affordability of alcohol, and the red bar is the uh, use of alcohol. We go back to 1971, the vertical dotted line. 1971 was a very important year. It's the year the Misuse of Drugs Act was brought in. And you can see then we were drinking on average about seven liters of alcohol a year, and now we're drinking about 11. So we've just somewhat less than doubled our alcohol intake as a country. 
there's been quite a big rise in the last few years, driven by Arco Pops and Super Strength Lagers, and by the affordability. Alcohol has become more affordable. The only, there have been two dips in, in terms of use. The first dip corresponded with a big rise in cannabis use, and the second with the rise in the use of drug products. But what is also not well known is that about a third of all the deaths from alcohol are in people who drink at, a, at what one would see as a normal level. The green sector is there. So these people are not dying of liver disease without ever having been dependent on alcohol. And when you talk to governments, when you talk to experts in medicine about this, you say, why, why doesn't this, why has this not led to some change in government behavior, the way tobacco deaths, cancer deaths from tobacco led to a quite a major change in the way we view tobacco. And there, there's no good reason, there's no good answer to that, but the usual story that's shown out is, well, some people benefit from alcohol. In fact, when the Prime Minister's strategy unit about 10 years ago did his report on alcohol, it said because there were some benefits, we had to discount all the harms because there were some benefits. Well, let me just show you these data. So these, these two sets of graphs, this is men, they show on the left-hand side the green bars, the benefits, on the right-hand side the blue bars, the deaths. And you can see that basically there are no benefits in young people. The benefits in men kick in at about, which from about 55. And there's st still, even when there's benefit, even in middle aged men, the deaths weigh greater than the benefits. So, this is a, the myth of benefits, is one that is. Um, been a huge smokescreen behind which to hide inactivity about alcohol. And just to, in that white box there, the beneficial, this is very recent data, came out about a month ago. So the best estimate we have now in terms of health benefits from alcohol is you shouldn't drink more um, 60 mils of wine or half a pint of beer a day. That's the optimum to optimize the benefits of alcohol. And very few people have the willpower to do that. And I'm going to see if I can manage to stick within the half. Of course, one of the problems with alcohol is it, by disinhibiting you, it does encourage increased use. If you want to see the data for women, that's here. And again, for women, the benefits don't really kick into your gain when you're from 50 onwards. But there's never a point at any age where the benefits of alcohol exceed the harms. And overall, the damage is maybe 50 times greater than the benefit. So it's really distorted. And, you know, I could say the same about tobacco. There are some benefits of smoking. If you survive the heart disease, if you survive the lung cancer, you're less likely to get demented. But we don't encourage people to smoke for that reason. We shouldn't be using this myth of health benefits to allow completely uncontrolled drinking. Now, what about cannabis? So this is... Uh, this is the man that's tacked to me. This is uh, Alan Johnson. I, I'm sure he's never smoked one of those. He says, I've probably smoked other things. So. This is me with a moustache somewhere being burnt alive there. And the argument went, I was, I was confusing people by saying that cannabis was less harmful than alcohol. Well, I just want to show you why I said it. So you remember that we saw over the... 40 years from 1971, alcohol intake went up about twice. These are the best data we have for cannabis, and you see it's gone up about 20 times from about 1971 to the latest data we have. So we had a massive, massive increase in cannabis use, 20-fold increase in users. But you might think if cannabis was causing harm, we might have, we might have seen some change in cannabis-related harm. Well, the problem is we didn't. If we actually look at which drugs kill you, we see on the left-hand side here, tobacco is still the big killer. Tobacco kills 80,000 a year, usually in their, from their 40s onwards. Alcohol kills about 8,000. Opiates kill just about 1,000. Then you go across paracetamol, about 200, cocaine, about 180, amphetamines, about 40. And cannabis, maybe just a few, maybe 10, 20 a year. 
So although there's been a huge increase in cannabis use, it hasn't translated, it's certainly into deaths. And could it have translated into something else? Well, the big scare then, and this was the, this was the, um, the creation of politicians and some doctors, was to try to say that cannabis caused schizophrenia. So we went to look at the data on the incidence and prevalence of schizophrenia and psychosis, or a, a more general term, to see if there's any sense in which it's gone up with this massive increase in cannabis use. And in fact, these are the data going back for a decade, and nowhere in this country, in fact, nowhere in the world, where we have data where cannabis use has increased by 20 times, as it has in almost all Western countries, not a single country can show you any increase in schizophrenia. So the relationship between cannabis and schizophrenia is very tenuous. It's probably there. It's probably there for a small group of people with genetic vulnerability. But we estimated that you've got to stop 5,000 young men from ever smoking cannabis to stop one case of schizophrenia. And that is not a public health approach that has any kind of meaning. But more importantly, that you cannot use the law to try to drive that public health outcome because of that, the harms that, that penalties will cause if you use legal approaches to stop cannabis use will be completely disproportionate to the gains. Nevertheless, Becky Smith, the Home Secretary at the time, we had our, our first run in over cannabis, and, um, and she said we're going to make cannabis, which had been class C, she was going to make it class B for these reasons, because of possible risk public perception, and policing priorities. Now, there's a lot of plosives in there. It's wonderful, isn't it? Alliteration after alliteration. But that isn't really the basis on which you should make laws. So when we said to her, well, look, you know, this is all very well, but actually, that won't make a blind bit of difference to use. It might criminalize people more. And actually, what you're doing is, why aren't you facing up to the challenge of alcohol? which is much, much more harmful. And she didn't want to answer that question and still doesn't. We think that this was probably a deal done between Gordon Brown and the Daily Mail. Um, when Gordon Brown took over from Tony Blair, he was reputed to have made a contract with the devil. That's Paul Dacre, that's his name. And um, uh, to get the Daily Mail to support him, in, in the election, it was it didn't ever happen. The, the election he chickened out of, and it's it is said that Dacre said he wanted three things in order to support the Labour Party. And one of them was reclassifying cannabis. I don't know what the other two were. It's a real pity he didn't get asked about this at Levinson because Levinson knows about this, but unfortunately he didn't ask them. And it is really kind of absurd, isn't it? That polish is to be made by the editor of one of the right-wing newspapers in this country. And it's even more absurd that a, that a Labour Prime Minister should ever think that the Daily Mail could suddenly change its spots and support him, as they didn't in the, in the election, although that was a, later, a few years later. Now, if you pull together all the evidence we have about drugs and the harms to the person, the harms to society, you, come, you can, using a... a complicated technique called multi-criteria decision analysis, estimate the overall harms of different drugs. And this is what this graph shows. And this, the blue bars are the harms to the user, and the red bars are the harms to society. And you can see that overall alcohol comes out the most harmful. And that's because it's got a big red bar. And the big red bar tells you that alcohol damages society. And you know it does. You, I've showed you that it's damaged the health costs over three billion, but the six billion costs in terms of just policing alcohol-related disorder and violence, and there's a huge amount of social services time uh, because alcohol is a major cause of domestic violence, child abuse, and road traffic accidents, etc. So there's a, the, the big red bar puts alcohol at the top, considerably higher than cannabis or tobacco. So this really is the evidence that government should have if it wants to do something serious about harm. But in fact, it doesn't. It wants to do something in 
concerned about young people using cannabis. It wants to avoid dealing with the drinks industry, which is too powerful. It wants to deal with young people who choose to use, um, to make a rational choice to use a less harmful drug than alcohol. And this is the cannabis conundrum. A lot of young people use it. There's very little harm to them. There's very little harm to society. But as soon as they get arrested, it changes their whole trajectory of their life because the criminal record makes it very difficult, for instance, to get jobs in, the, in government or travel to certain countries. It also denies access to cannabis for therapy. And I would argue that is completely unjust. And this is what Jackie Smith did. So she decided that she wanted to protect people from cannabis by criminalizing them. And it's very easy to get people criminalized. You just tell the police that they get rewarded every time they arrest someone for possessing cannabis. And because you can't swallow a joint, it's very easy if you see someone that might have cannabis on them to arrest them and prove that they have it. And here she did, in her, her tenure as Home Secretary, she doubled the number of people who were arrested. And we saw this atrocious behavior in London. On the tube stations, you know, where in the poorer parts of London, there will be police with sniffer dogs stopping people as they come up the escalator. They can't go back down, they push them to one side, they sniff them, and then they find cannabis and they arrest them. And that's all incentivized by Jackie Smith, just to try to uh, show that she was being hard on drugs. And of course she was being hard, but as always she was being hard on ethnic minorities because there was a disproportionate number of arrests in ethnic minority groups. And it's kind of weird that we've got to this situation. Because a hundred years ago, things were quite different. This is Queen Victoria in her youth. And Albert, Albert was still alive then and they were producing lots of children. And she wrote eulogies about the benefits of cannabis for period pains and for the pains of childbirth. And her physician wrote the definitive treatise on the medicinal use of cannabis. Cannabis has been a medicine for over 4,000 years. So here you have the most powerful woman in the world, the Empress of the Commonwealth, using cannabis regularly. I sometimes reflect as to whether she used it at other times and just dealing with period pains. Maybe that's why she had so many children. I don't know. But, um, but at the very least, this was an acceptable medicine. It was banned in 1971 because uh, a couple of GPs started prescribing it and telling people to use it for fun rather than for medicine. And instead of just banning the doctors, the government did what it's doing now, what it's doing now with drugs like methadrone, and it's going to do with benzofury, etc. It's going to ban the drug without any real understanding of the possible utility. So there you have it, you know, the head of state using cannabis regularly in Victorian days. What do we come to now? Well, we come to this. This is a true story. This is a direct consequence of the way in which we have decided to attack cannabis users to, I think, deflect attention from alcohol. But here you have a woman with untreatable illness the only thing that works is cannabis. She's in a wheelchair. But three times the police break her door down to arrest her for possessing cannabis. And I'm sure if they just rang the bell, she'd open it for them. She couldn't run out the window. She's stuck in a wheelchair. But of course, the war on drugs gives a lot of license to people to act like soldiers. They like, these quite enjoy getting up at five in the morning, smashing the doors of houses down, because they get a lot of overtime. And it's kind of, you know, it's exciting. But it's totally inhumane. And it, it's, it's, I find it appalling that in this country this can happen. What, under what kind of pretext could you argue that this was actually of benefit to anyone? And if she does that, if they do it again, she will go to prison. Because the rule is you, three offenses is the maximum you can have without going to prison. But there's a worse thing. And this truly was the most noxious judgment that I've certainly seen, and certainly the most appalling piece of lawmaking through the last government. In this country, we have, under common law, the, the defense of necessity, which says basically, you know, if you have to do something because the, it's the only way to relieve yourself from the threat of death or suffering, then you can plead that defense. So you could argue, you know, that if, 
cannabis was the only thing that helped your terrible spasm from your multiple sclerosis. So you can say when you're arrested, I had to use it. Which, of course, for many people is true. Well, this was then removed from the statute books in 2005, only for cannabis. So you can argue that your crystal meth you had to take if you're Andre Agassi to deal with your headaches, but cannabis cannot be used for anything. So any free one who's arrested is prosecuted. There's no defense. And magistrates hate this because they see 18-year-olds coming in and they know they've got to give them a criminal sanction. But why did, why did this happen? Why did we deny the defense of necessity? Well, it was done essentially to improve conviction rates. You can read about it here in one of my blogs. But the most atrocious aspect of this, the three law lords that did it, one of this, one of them was Lord Bingham. And when he was made a law lord, he, he, just, he allowed himself to be interviewed by the spectator, by a certain Boris Johnson, who said to him, so you would legalize cannabis? And Bingham said, yes, absolutely. It's a stupid having a law which is not doing what it's there for. So two years before he denied the ability of people to use cannabis as a last resort for medical illness, he was arguing that the law on cannabis should be removed. So he switched completely. And if ever, any of you think that there is independence of judiciary in this country, this will make you be, make you sit up and take notice. Because this is truly one of the most atrocious examples of, of political control of the judiciary of state. But there is another way. There's a much more humane way. It obviously involves spending 20,000 a year going to the right school, but if you can do that, you can engage in uh, dialogues with headmasters who perhaps have a bit more latitude in some. So this is what happened in 1982. On the one side is David Cameron, the other side is Josh Astor. Astor is even richer than Cameron, and they both are eaten together. And they were both caught smoking cannabis. And what they did with Cameron was they said he hadn't dealt it, he just smoked it, so they gave him sanctions. He couldn't go out to the tea shop on Saturdays. And he had to write out hundreds of lines of Latin. Now, he won't tell us what he had to write, but I wonder if it was this. Um, I'm not sure, but I think it... In fact, seven boys were expelled, five were suspended, and four were gated. And Astor was expelled. He was one of the ringleaders of Burgess and he's gone on, like most people do who are expelled from school for drug offenses. They go on to do more drugs because, frankly, that's all you can do if you're expelled from school, which is one of the reasons we try not to expel people from school. And he's had a very checkered career with multiple convictions for drugs. Cameron, on the other hand, in the words of the headmaster, went on from being the most difficult boy I've ever taught. He hasn't changed much. Uh, so actually it became Dave C. He became David C. David C. He was a progressive MP. And he, when the Prince of Darkness, Howard, decided to ban raves, mostly because people were having fun, he, def he argued against it because his wife was having, wife-to-be was having fun. She likes raves. She was one in Ibiza the last year. Um, and he also argued strongly when he was on the Home Affairs Select Committee that ecstasy should be downgraded. And we should review the whole international regulation of drugs. This is the point. This is in his report, 2004. We recommend that the government initiates a discussion within the Commission on Narcotic Drugs of alternative ways, including the possibility of legalization and regulation to tackle the global drugs dilemma. There you are. So he was progressive. David C., the progressive MP. As soon as he became leader of the Tory party, he became Dave, which I object to, because I'm Dave, and I'm older than him. And, um, and then he retracted his views the next day. Science hadn't changed, but politics had. 
And now he's bringing in a drugs bill. And the drugs bill essentially says that that drug addiction is not an illness, it's a lifestyle choice. That is a very clever bill. Because basically at a stroke, they can stop funding the treatment of drug addiction in the NHS. So we can save 10% of the NHS bill. So it's an atrocious attack on, on people who've got disabling addiction. And it's all based on this false premise. It's all based on the premise that if you, as a rich uh, Etonian and Oxonian, that meant that someone went to Oxford, um, can use drugs and then switch to become prime minister, then everyone can switch. And I would argue that that, that actually is a false premise. And a lifestyle choice is at the top here, and that's joining the Bullingdon Club and taking large amounts of stimulants so you can get drunk and smash up bars. And drug addiction is different. And the idea that you treat everyone as if they have the privilege of going to or joining the Bullingdon Club is quite outrageous, and it's something we should oppose. There's one other particularly malevolent influence in terms of being rational about drugs, and that's the media. And I've already touched on some aspects of it. But this is a brilliant PhD done by a Scottish uh, undergraduate. And what he did was he looked at the data on coroner's deaths in Scotland for the whole of the 1990s. And they have better data than we had in England and Wales. And he looked at every person who's died that had a drug other than alcohol in their system. And he showed there were about 2,500 deaths. And about, he then went to all the newspapers, and he showed about one in four deaths get reported. And then he looked to see if there was any uh, difference in terms of reporting and drugs. And he found remarkable things. He found that if you died of paracetamol, even though you're mostly a young woman, you didn't get it reported at all. He died of morphine, one in 72 reports. The press are pretty uninterested in most of these deaths. However, when there were, of the 20, 36 deaths, so it's maybe 20 of them died actually of amphetamine, about one in three got reported. And then cocaine was one in eight, heroin was one in five, methadone was one in 16. But one drug was always reported, and that was ecstasy. And that's why people think ecstasy is killing lots of people, because that's all they read about in the newspaper. And uh, this bias in reporting has a profound influence on politicians, because that's all they read, if they read at all. So that was one of the reasons ecstasy got banned, because people thought it was very dangerous, because that was what they were reading about. And the situation hasn't changed, so we move on 20 years. We come to methadrone, meow, meow, MCAT, whatever. And this was one of the most surreal phone conversations of my life. I was in a taxi, I was going to give a lecture in Barcelona. And I got rung up by CNN. And I'd done an interview on methadrone with them about two days before. And they said, where's Scunthorpe? I said, what? Where's Scunthorpe? Why do you want to go to Scunthorpe? Because the Humberside police have called an international press conference to tell the world that two boys, they believe, have died of methadrone. I said, well, that's impossible. Because I know that methadrone had been used by hundreds of thousands of young Israelis for two years, three years before this, and none had died. Chances of two people on the same night dying of methadrone is nil. Anyway, I said, well, you've got to go on the M1 for four hours and then turn right. And I don't know if they made it, but if they had made it, they'd have heard Nick's dad. Here's Nick. His dad said, I don't want him to be able to drug you because he wasn't. He was just on a night out with friends enjoying himself, a normal, caring, hard-working man. And, of course, that is completely true, for the, except for the one word druggy, because, of course... Of course Nick was a druggie, because he'd drunk probably about 12 pints or more that night with his mate. And they'd wandered off, and they had uh, then taken uh, drugs. Now, there was no evidence to suspect they'd taken methadrone, but the police, I believe, knew that if they said methadrone, they'd get a huge amount of media interest. 
And they did, and they got an international press conference. And in fact, it turned out that the boys hadn't taken methadone at all, but this was sort of a tipping point. Everyone was concerned that methadone was wiping out our young people. In fact, it turned out that they'd taken methadone, and it's unfortunate that methadone and methadone do sound the same. People do make mistakes. And what we had, and this is exactly the same rhetoric as we had on question time last week, we had this bizarre recreation of a rhetoric which we've had for a hundred years or more. We had Gordon Brown saying, we must stamp out this evil. Now, I don't know what you think, but I don't think drugs that have a consciousness. I don't think white powder can actually decide between right and wrong. But the way we try to, the way we just use this infantile approach to drugs is exactly repetitive of what we used a hundred years ago with cocaine. And has cocaine gone away? No, cocaine hasn't gone away. In fact, the only, the only thing, the impact anyone in this country has ever made on cocaine use was the onset of methadone. No government policy has changed this rising number of deaths each year from cocaine. Methadone came along, people switched, and deaths fell. If the government had thought of it, they would be claiming it, but they wouldn't. Here's the last death before the ban. Again, she'd not taken methadone. No one had taken methadone. I don't know if anyone's ever died of methadone. The government statistics are so bad, and, and they're all bad that I think it's hard to know whether anyone actually but then you might say, well, what does it matter? You know, it's probably, isn't it better that young kids aren't taking drugs? You know, so, well, maybe that's true. But then let's look objectively at what, what the benefits there might be of methadone. I mean, I've mentioned the cocaine deaths. Here they are. So, 20% fewer deaths of cocaine as people switch to methadone. And lots of other people switch to methadone. Soldiers. So, 1,200, that's like 1% of the army, fewer people kicked out because the army doesn't test for methadone, it doesn't test for cocaine. And it was import duty. And you kind of think, well, there's some benefits here. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we should have thought about this before we banned it. Maybe it was doing more good than harm. And I have to say, you know, if, if you say, any of you work in public service, if you say that, you also get sacked. But but just say, you heard me say it, it's not your idea, right? And then I got to thinking, I got to thinking, well, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe there are benefits of all these other drugs that we've banned. What might they be? And this is my favorite example. So these are two Nobel Prize winners. These have actually won the most important Nobel Prizes in medicine. They've changed, they've, these, these are the two great transformations in medicine in the last 150 years discovering the genetic code, and working out how a technique to measure it. And these both got their insights from NSD when it was legal. And I kind of think maybe, maybe, we, maybe we're not solving problems. Maybe the Higgs boson, we'd have discovered it 20 years ago if scientists were, I don't know. And it's, there's a real paradox here. That almost all the drugs which are illegal had been developed for therapeutic uses. And they got banned when kids started using them. And it, it's very, very disappointing to me to see patients, scientists being denied access to some of the most potentially powerful tools, powerful medicines, simply because the government wants to try to stop young people using them. For no, no very good reason other than that young people aren't using them. And here are the examples. And I've decided to, to kind of do something about this. So I've started working with psilocybin. First time, I mean, the first person in the UK to do studies with psilocybin, magic mushroom juice. Really difficult to do because the, you know, you have, it takes a year to get permissions. So I've done it, and I'm doing it. And one of the most remarkable things we discovered in our early work is that Psilocybin has a completely opposite effect in the brain to what we predicted. We kind of thought, well, you see lots of color kaleidoscopic images, that would mean your visual cortex is being switched on. But it turns out it's not being switched on. In fact, 
psilocybin just dampens down brain. Where it, where it changes brain function, it dampens it down. And what's amazing about this image, this is the front of the brain there, in the, inside the yellow circle is a part of the brain which is overactive in depression, which is turned off by psilocybin. Now, it's another talk, the whole use of this in depression and other disorders. But the point is, unless we've done that study, we would never have predicted this. But having done it, we've now been able to write a grant to get a, a money to actually do the study to see whether this will be an, a new treatment for depression. It doesn't respond to other treatments because it works in the right part of the brain uh, to turn off that part of the brain. So we thought this is pretty nifty. You know, this is it's actually moving the field on along. Now, this man may be one of your MPs. He's, he's from around here. Any of you know him? Jim Dobbin? I think he's a bit further south, south of Manchester. So this is an MP, this is what he said when we went public with his discovery. And why was Professor Nutt allowed to do a study with an illegal drug? And this really gets to the crux. Because when something's illegal, people lose all ration of it, rationality about it, as he's done. I mean, I'm sorry, you know, there are some of my books over here, you know. He'll be burning them soon. I want to finish by just trying to bring some important comparisons into the debate. Because drugs are just but one of many ways in which people can harm themselves. And I've spent the 10 years I worked in the government on the drugs, trying to develop better ways of assessing the harms of drugs and thinking more creatively about comparators. And I want to share with you a couple of comparators. One of the most interesting ones is this one, sun tanning. Because a lot of us like to get sun. Sun tanning is uh, very popular. But it changes the brain. It releases particular hormones, uh, MCH, etc. Some of them, some of that is released by drugs like ecstasy. And it's very enjoyable. Young people do it. But it kills them later in life. There are 10,000 cases of melanoma a year now, and largely driven by sun, sun tanning. So this is probably more dangerous than any drug other than tobacco or alcohol. But we don't ban it. We try to educate people. We try to stop under-18s going into sun pits. For a long time, I've argued that in a country which actively markets a substance as toxic as alcohol to people, they should, at the very least, allow people to make a rational decision to use a less harmful drug. And this paper I published six years ago now, arguing that um, ecstasy is actually less harmful than alcohol. And that caused a bit of a stir, but not enough to get me sacked. But the next paper really did it, the horse riding paper. And I just need to share with you the, um, the background to this paper. So I'm a psychiatrist. I see people. I treat them with drugs. That's my expertise, drugs. And um, I got the job in the first place because I knew how to spell them. And um, I was in my clinic, and this woman about 37 came in with a friend, come a long way. It's a very specialist clinic. And she had fallen off a horse about two years before, and she smashed the front of her brain in. And her personality had changed. And she'd become very disinhibited, very aggressive. And her husband had left her, taken the children away, she'd lost her job. And she almost was unable to live in her local community because people didn't want to have her in a pub, in a pub or the supermarket. So I treated her. I actually treated her with an illegal drug. I gave her amphetamine because amphetamine can help control very impulsive behavior like it does in people with ADHD. Um, it didn't cure her, obviously, because she's lost a large chunk of her brain. But it got me thinking, how dangerous is horse riding? And I read some papers, and I discovered it's exceptionally dangerous. People would break their neck, they'd die, break their backs, etc. So then I decided to do a thought experiment and create a new drug called Equacy, Equine Addiction Syndrome. And I wrote a paper about it. And it was actually a very successful paper because several of my friends said, God, I read to the second page before I realized you were taking, taking the rise out of me. Um, and, and this compares and contrasts ecstasy with ecstasy, and ecstasy is an addictive behavior. Because a lot of people who ride horses become very dependent on the horse riding. And 
Here are the comparisons. Here you can see, you know, chances of dying on ecstasy, chances of dying on equity. I like to say to the police, well, equity is much easier to police because you can't smuggle a horse into a club, can you? You know. And if you're into green, you know, carbon dioxide, you know, as much as methane, much less methane from an ecstasy pill. So basically, you know, it's an interesting comparison. It, it, certainly horse riding is as dangerous as taking ecstasy, probably more so. But that created an enormous amount of antagonism from some elements of the press. And uh, three days after the paper was published, I got a phone call in the same room as I'd seen the patient from Jackie Smith, uh, the Home Secretary, and, uh, and she started sort of shrieking at me. And being a skilled psychiatrist, I sort of edged her around to engaging in the dialogue that I wanted to engage in. And, uh, and, it, and the conversation then went like this. You can't compare the harms of an illegal activity with a legal one. Why not? Because one's illegal. Why is it illegal? Because it's harmful. Don't we need to compare harm to determine if it should be illegal? I put, I put the thinks in the brackets. Um, you can't compare harms. Sort of circular logic. I found quite chilly. You know, here's one of the most powerful people in the country. Cannot understand that, that there's a logical fallacy in that. And then I started talking to other politicians. And they said, well, no, we all think like this. And, and, and that got me really worried, and, and, and that's why I'm more and more resolute in my belief that you mustn't criminalize people. Because if you criminalize them for anything, they become worthless, they become sub uh, underclass. And, and you can't break from that. In fact, there's only one known exception to that rule. And he's called Coulson. Anyway. I've been critical of lots of things, particularly politicians. I'm not a negative person, as you probably gather. Uh, I'm, there's lots of simple things we can do to improve the drug laws. These are all proven approaches, proven in other countries, not ours, that would make useful impact and reduce harm and be, give us a more legal and equitable state. They're all, they're all there. If you want to read about them, they're in the book. We could even be more radical. We could do what the Dutch do. and let their, The Dutch have this testing system so their kids know what they're taking. So, you know, it would actually stop people dying for taking the wrong stuff. You know, it seemed to me that was actually quite a sensible approach. But I didn't want to go that far, so I said to Jackie Smith, could we please invite the Dutch over just to tell us what they do and how they do it? Because it might, we might learn something from them. And she said, no. And this, you know, re-emphasizes the problem. Politicians do not want to face the truth about drugs. They want them to be evil things that bad people do, and they don't want to have to think about it at all. They want to just dismiss them. And there's other things you could do. I could make a safe alcohol. I could make, and I may do that yet in the next few years before I die. I could make a cocktail that you could drink. It would take, you'd believe it was alcohol. It would intoxicate you, but it wouldn't harm your liver or your heart or your brain. And better still, I could give you an antidote, and you'd sober up and be able to drive. I could do that. I know that. I know the science behind that. Why haven't I done it? Because no one will fund it. Because they say, David, we invest five million pounds in doing this. What if the government then makes it illegal? And of course, the government might make it illegal. Because even though it was safe, it wouldn't be difficult to get a few newspapers to start getting hysterical about it, and therefore get it banned. So we're in a position, you know, where science is really on the back foot. I could also make safe versions of MDMA for therapy. That's something else I'm trying to do. Okay, well, they could sack me. They couldn't get rid of me. Well, I was sacked. Seven of the um, scientists on the committee also resigned. But this rubbish that Johnson said on last week in question time, you can see I'm a bit exercised by that, which he said, I, I, he sacked me because the rest of the committee didn't have faith in me. I mean, how can seven people resign you know, if they didn't believe what I was doing was right? So, the fact is, I've set up this independent committee. It's the only truly independent committee giving advice on drugs in the world. Because almost every other website that talks about drugs is either in the pocket of governments or in the pockets of people who are enthusiasts about drugs. But this one's neutral. This one just tells the truth about drugs. And then I'm going to finish with this is the last slide, which is my new book. And it tells it all. 
If you want, if you want it, there's some copies here and I will sign them after we have questions. Thank you very much. David Knott, ladies and gentlemen. Good Lord.